Now, while technology will no doubt evolve for both battery storage and for pumped hydro, and also for transmission of electricity in the future, it will also evolve for the capture of carbon dioxide. And these developments will no doubt change the viability of hydrocarbon projects into the future as well. Just think the giant gas projects around Australia, many of which are still awaiting approvals. Well, in recent weeks on Business Weekend, we took you to Chevron's carbon capture facility at the Gorgon Gas Project in WA. So far, that project, to be honest, has fallen short of its targeted carbon capture. Now, here is what the company told the media at that time. One of the things I say with any new technology, whether it's CCS, whether it's wind, solar, any of the other technologies that have developed over time, there's always a cost curve and a learning curve associated with it. Initial projects always cost more, and as you develop more and more projects over time, the unit cost of those projects are gonna come down. And the big question there, of course, is how fast does this learning curve take? When might we expect effective carbon capture? And then that don't leak emissions. Perry Wilson is the head of advisory for the energy research firm Rystad. I spoke with him a little earlier. The reality is that there are a lot of net zero strategies, especially in the Asia Pacific region and Australia, that, that need carbon capture and storage to work and, and utilisation as well. I think that if we are to wait and allow the energy transition to ultimately take on its own path, how on earth can we justify the cost that you need to spend on then disaster recovery and remediation rather than funding technology that's actually going to affect that change up front? So the reality is, is it the reverse of basically taking hydrocarbons out of the ground when you're trying to put the carbon dioxide back in? So is that simply adding cost to the whole project, to the viability of these projects in the first place? Certainly if you consider it as, you know, in the past, the emissions we just released, and that was the end of that, and we didn't consider that. We are adding a step to that process on. We ultimately have to capture that carbon, figure out a way to actually then transport it to an area, and then store it underground or utilise it in another product. That is an additional step that didn't exist before, and so that is a cost. And so there's certainly a need then to consider what's the use of either incentives or carbon taxes to provide that carrot or stick to actually make this work. OK, so then let's explain it to people, because when, say, for example, gas is extracted from Chevron or from Woodside Projects, whatever they might be, it comes out, it's then liquefied in those giant plants that they have, and then it's actually transported to customers overseas. Is the reverse also true of when you're trying to store carbon dioxide, that you're actually trying to store it as a liquid? Is that the most efficient form of storage? Yeah, to an extent, you're absolutely right. Now, there is an element of getting the geology right. You know, there were concerns in the early days around potentially leakage from certain caverns. There has been a lot of research on that, and if there is the right top layer of rock, it should ultimately stay underground. Now, you've talked briefly about the Gorgon project, and so it's easy to get confused and say, well, carbon capture doesn't work. The reality for that is there were issues with actually getting the, the water out of that aquifer um, to relieve the pressure. And so it's not quite the issue where we've got lots of carbon dioxide leaking. So when we think about carbon capture and storage, there's ultimately those three elements. You capture it, you transport it, and then you store it in those caverns. And so something that we've done really well for a long time is the carbon capture piece. Now we're in the early phase of those storage um, projects really taking off. And we're also in the early phase of utilization, which is different again. OK, so go to utilisation, because that's, say, for example, where even gas right now, natural gas, is used as a feedstock to make fertilisers, to make things such as ammonia, to make, in the future, even explosives. So what can carbon dioxide be used to manufacture? That's correct. So when we're thinking about trying to navigate the energy transition, an important part of this is ultimately fuels. And when I think about that, I'm talking about aviation fuel. So you've heard it as SAF or sustainable aviation fuel and shipping fuel as well. Those are two elements that could fit this really, really well when we think about carbon capture and storage, because that process of refining ultimately re re releases emissions. And so this is providing something for it. So in, in that essence, we're talking about utilization. Other products that exist um, are something like uh, building materials. So there's actually businesses within Australia trying this at the moment, where you take that carbon dioxide and sequester it directly in a building material like plasterboard, and you're actually creating a circular economy then. You're capturing that carbon, you're storing it within another product, and that's becoming a useful product for an entirely another life as well. OK, so because that's the other aspect of carbon capture, it's not just, say, for big energy projects where it's quite clear and demonstrable, the emissions, but it also goes to 
industry as well. So it goes to cement works, it goes to steel works, it goes to aluminium smelters, where they also are significant emitters of, of carbon dioxide. And so therefore they need to mitigate in some way. Now, one way is that they can simply buy carbon credits, but the better way is to try and use that carbon dioxide. Is this some of the technology you're talking about? Absolutely. So you've mentioned there the hard to abate sectors. When we think about electrification and then renewable energy being the only way to solve our issues. The reality is that those hard to abate sectors can't just simply electrify all of their needs. There are a number of high temperature applications simply cannot get there with electricity alone at the moment. And that's why I've referenced the energy transition. Potentially they will in the future, but that could be decades away. But that's not here now for, say, steel making is the classic one of those, which needs coal and the iron ore. That's the recipe to make steel right now. Now, in the future, it may be different, but that's the way it's done now. That's exactly it. And again, another example where they're looking for several avenues, they're looking at the hydrogen route, there's a gas route as well. But the reality at the moment is we use coal to make steel. And so there are emissions re related. And until we solve how to then change that process and capture those emissions, that will continue to exist during this transition. Period. Okay, so is it reasonable enough for a steelworks here or in China or wherever it might be to capture their emissions right now and to seek to bury them. Is that going to make that plant viable? Is it going to make it realistic to actually make steel that way? It would be remiss of me to say that that will make it absolutely viable. Every project has its own economics and own specifics. But I think without exploring that as an option, we're ultimately burying our heads in the sand and saying renewables are the answer and we're going to have to solve this in time. So this is fascinating. So in that case, many of those businesses are still really beholden on buying carbon credits off the international markets to be able to mitigate their own emissions. Surely the technology would be better if they could actually capture that carbon, just as they scrub other pollution which comes out of their stacks, and somehow use it or change the, change the process, shall I say? Carbon credits are an important mechanism in what we're trying to do with energy transition. They certainly are. But ultimately, we are trying to directly decarbonise operations. And so when we think about long-term solutions, we need to consider how can we actually reduce or remove those carbon emissions from the atmosphere. When we use fossil fuels, we take them out the ground, we create emissions and add to that global carbon budget. Ultimately, when we capture that carbon and store it back in the ground, we have effectively completed that process. So whether it's storing or utilising as an another product we are physically removing that carbon from the carbon budget and that's ultimately a success okay a couple of times in this conversation you have mentioned a carbon price now i've also mentioned buying offsets off the off the market is that not effectively the carbon price the price of those offsets or does there actually need to be a set carbon dioxide emissions price, which has been controversial politically, of course, to be able to give the incentive to allow some of these remission projects to be created in the first place. So I think it's both. There are examples of a carbon price. Singapore has one and Europe's been talking about it for some time, of course. And so I think there is certainly room for that. The nervousness is then it fixes everyone and it brings a tax in that businesses haven't had to deal with. The reality of the carbon credit at the moment gives people flexibility to choose the projects, choose the carbon credits that they actually want to use and consider whether or not that fits with their overall strategy and the impact they would like to make. Perry Wilson from Rystead, great to have you in the program today. Many thanks for your time.